Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, Brian, and uh, welcome to Brandforsk and this uh, result webinar. We will get a presentation of the results from the project An Holistic Approach for Fire Safety Requirements and Design of Facade Systems, or just uh, HOLIFAS, as we have called it. Uh, Patrick, Brian, and Michael will uh, present the project and answer your questions. And I see that we have still some attendees coming in. And uh, Patrick, Brian, Michael, would you like to turn on your cameras and microphones and, and say hi and maybe introduce yourself? Okay, uh, maybe I will start. And uh, my name is Patrick Van Hees. I'm a professor in fire safety engineering at Lund uh, University. Uh, and I was the overall project leader of, of this project. And uh, I have a background uh, in, uh, in a lot of. Uh, testing and uh, assessment of uh, different building products, building materials, uh, apart from fire safety engineering, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Meacham. I uh, have an individual consulting firm here in the US. I have a strong background in fire safety engineering and uh, risk and regulatory policy. I've been uh, teaching and researching and consulting in fire safety engineering and building regulations for uh, about 30 years now. And I was working in this project on the uh, assessment of the regulatory system and how that holistic component fits in with this issue with facade safety. And hi, um, I'm Michael Strumgen with uh, REAB. And um, uh, I, uh, work with uh, um, re regulatory affairs and industry affairs with BRIAB uh, and I have a background as uh, doing research in um, uh, the Swedish building regulations and international standards and regulations uh, and um, I'm also involved in uh, uh, part of the um, uh, revision of the of the current system now with the, with the industry um, and um, I'm also uh, a lot involved in the ongoing digitalization of fire safety on the on the international level. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Just a few words about Brown Fork before we start. Um, we have a vision. It's a fire safe society built on knowledge. Uh, we develop and communicate knowledge, uh, mainly research, uh, to limit the negative consequences of fire in the society. We started in 1979 and since last year we are a foundation. Uh, we have a lot of supporting organizations that fund everything that we do. And it, this makes us a collaboration between many parts of the society. And with the funding so far this year is about 600,000 euro. And um, we use the money for funding research projects like, like this one and also communicating results like we are doing right now. We also have a research school for practicing fire safety engineers at fire services that makes them part-time PhD students for a couple of years. And we have scholarships for students. And these are our supporting organizations this year. And uh, it's really thanks to them that we can do this. And as I said, the funding so far this year is about 600,000 euro. Well, the program today looks like this. Um, I'm beginning to feel ready with the introduction so that we can get to the presentation of the results. Uh, after that, we will have time for questions and discussions. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Patrick van Hees. I'm professor in fire safety engineering at Lund University. And this presentation will also be given by Mikkel Strumgren and uh, Brian Meacham. Um, the project I'm going to present is uh, HOLIFAS, a holistic uh, approach for fire safety requirements and design of facade systems. The layout of the presentation is uh, that we start with some background and objectives. Uh, we then talk uh, about several, several technical aspects of the project and we finish off with uh, conclusions and future uh, research. What is the background to this project is, of course, you're all uh, aware that we had several facades fires worldwide. The latest one was in, in, in Grenfell, um, on the left uh, down, 
uh, but we have them uh, everywhere in the world. So uh, as you can see on, on the list, uh, both in the US, uh, but also in, in the, um, Australia and in the, the Middle East. So the objectives of the uh, project is that uh, we want to have fire safety requirements on external facade systems through a technical holistic approach. And this holistic approach is including also the building regularly process from a social technical perspective. Um, we also will in identify uh, the research gaps and the research questions. The setup was that we first started to collect all the different facade systems on the market or um, uh, as good as possible. Uh, then we had the technical requirements of these facade systems um, and we then went on to the social technical system considerations and finishing off uh, then with reporting dissemination and management of the project. The methods used for this project is uh, of course a broad literature review. Uh, we then use also a number of surveys, uh, for instance BRIAP did before the project already a market survey which we could uh, use. Uh, we had several interviews with uh, experts and then we had also expert meetings and discussions, especially within the Swedish Building University where we have a, a subgroup on uh, technical functions uh, of, of buildings, uh, where we had the perfect opportunity to discuss uh, the other technical properties uh, with them. Um, let me first try to convince you why we need more system and holistic thinking in, for instance, a fire testing area. Uh, we know that traditionally, based on uh, standardized uh, tests at international uh, level and regional level, is, is quite common. Um, we use these tests uh, to uh, approve um, products, materials, or, or also systems. And, and quite often, these standardized tests or scenario defined, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's reaction to fire or uh, fire resistance test. So they're very specific. Um, but it is so that today's fire risk are much more complex and need different view angles to tackle the, the problem. And therefore, the, an overall view is necessary. And, and this is exactly what uh, we call a holistic uh, approach. Uh, a facade system is really a typical example for such uh, a need for system and holistic uh, thinking. Uh, we have different type of systems. I'll come back to that later. Uh, we have different type of other technical properties, and I will mention that also later. Uh, we have socio-technical aspects, uh, and then we have different type of fires happening in these buildings with uh, facade systems. Um, and connected to these fires, uh, they will result in different fire risks. And then, of course, in order to evaluate the, the, the risks, uh, we have even different type of uh, fire test methods. First, a little bit about the different systems and the complexity. Uh, the results uh, we uh, found in this uh, project. Um, these difficult uh, to, to classify facades from time to time and the possible classification of facade systems was done based on market surveys, literature studies, meetings and interview with uh, experts. And the first thing which uh, appeared clearly if we talk with the different technical areas is that uh, we maybe need a clear definition of what is considered as a facade or a facade system. Uh, there's quite a different uh, view on what is the facade, uh, if we see it from the constructional part or from our, the material and a building product side. So what's happening then that we could see that apart from this definition, we also that uh, we got a, a very big myriad of different systems. And I'll go through them uh, in the following uh, uh, slides. Um, the first type of uh, uh, system is uh, a typical, uh, let's say, low ventilated uh, cavity uh, facade system. Um, on the left, you see an example of a brick veneer where you have a, a, a brick wall and then a cavity and then a possible uh, insulation and, and the rest of, of the construction wall. Uh, to the right, you see a similar construction where uh, the outside is, is a wooden paneling uh, and the construction is more wood-based. Uh, uh, but they all are uh, characterized by having a cavity with a rather low uh, ventilation in it. If we then uh, see to the um, 
complexity and go to another system that is our the the rendered system here and and the best is to 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 look to the the picture here to the right is that you have the the wall system and then um which can be either concrete it can be wood also but then uh, you have uh, the insulation uh, and then you have a rendering here on on top of it um which is uh, used and they are quite often uh, called ethics uh, systems uh, and to the left you you see an example of such um, an ethics system another area are panel systems and you can see them on, on the picture uh, here you um, use sandwich panels um, quite often steel insulation and steel um, you have a supporting uh, structure quite often steel columns and the panels are then placed uh, in, in between these uh, uh, supporting uh, columns and quite often uh, the outer facade and uh, the panels are part of the uh, complete building wall um, and these are then uh, specifically uh, the panel systems uh, another area which is uh, being uh, uh, quite uh, attractive or curtain wall claddings and on the picture you see an example where you uh, add then to the the normal wall construction uh, a, a, another structure in this case it's uh, a glazing uh, and quite often this is used in fact uh, for glazed facades and then uh, you can see it also on the picture you have uh, a, a rather large cavity uh, which you can uh, access even uh, and then you have another window system which is uh, part of the wall uh, and these have also specific uh, requirements so they have to be treated in a different way then the area is uh, where we go to uh, the rain screen claddings uh, a little bit in a similar way to the so-called low cavity uh, systems uh, you have here also a cavity as you you can see on the pictures um, both on the left and the right um, but on the outer uh, part the the cladding is is a rain screen to protect uh, the um, wall construction from from the the rain but it is not uh, completely watertight so quite often and you can see it on on the picture here uh, is uh, a uh, an opening between the panels and quite often that's that's done for uh, stabilization uh, for for wind stability um, behind the the, the cladding itself you have a supporting structure and then uh, as you you can see here there is uh, insulation and then uh, as in this mock-up uh, there is the rest of, of the, the wall of the of the building we also uh, detected a, a number of special systems they are not really so easy to put in into the other ones so so in the report and there are more than ones i present here uh, or uh, given on the sub chapter special systems and one of them is of course green buildings as you can see here uh, where there are plants uh, and and bushes even as, as you can see uh, as part of the outer uh, facade in the same way like you have green roofs uh, another special system worth to to mention is uh, that the uh, external wall is is cladded with uh, solar panels and then you will produce of course electricity uh, through the, the the panels on the facade uh, of course you have to realize that this will introduce electrical ignition sources uh, and also can in case of a fire create some problems for the fire brigade so this was uh, an overview uh, uh, quickly of the different systems uh, we then also did a number of interviews, a literature study and expert meeting within the Swedish Building University, uh, as well as a, a PhD uh, course uh, to, to discuss uh, all the kind of different technical properties. Uh, in view of the time scale of this presentation, I cannot go into very much detail for each of them, uh, but we identified uh, other technical properties like, for instance, humidity, uh, rain screen properties, insulation, mechanical stability for the fixing systems, wind stability and pressure equalization, especially if we have a high rise, uh, acoustics, which can be a, a, uh, an issue in certain cases, the aesthetics uh, and the durability. And you might have even uh, a few dots here more because uh, we, uh, we can have a, a lot of technical properties of, of facades. And it's important that each type of the facade systems, which I uh, presented, um, earlier has very complex properties connected to that 
uh, this is not only the case for fire, but also for these other properties. So you cannot treat every system in the same way for these technical properties. So general rules or uh, for general uh, facade properties are, are not so easy uh, to do. And I'm just going to give now a few examples. The first one is the, the rain screen cladding uh, system where you, you have the external cladding, as you can see here. Uh, and then you have the, the big cavity, uh, which is uh, having its supporting structure. Uh, and also, of course, still because of the openings in the cladding, uh, will get water in it. And it's necessary that this water is uh, uh, going out of this uh, cavity uh, and not staying there because it can affect uh, the, the remaining of the construction. And that's important for, for these systems. I'll come back to that also later in another slide. Uh, other humidity problems can be through, uh, and then we talk especially about the rendered uh, systems uh, that you, you have the insulation and the rendering that you have cracks and the water is going all the way into the insulation and in, in the worst case even to the construction. Uh, this can be through cracks but it can be also to uh, uh, ways of, of capillarity. Um, and Connected to these problems of humidity and water, uh, you can even have the, the so-called fungi problem where you get these uh, fungi coming onto the, the rendering, as you can see in the picture uh, below. I want to, to finish up with uh, these uh, technical uh, properties with, with combined problems because uh, it is uh, important to see that you, you sometimes have uh, a, a fire problem for in the, within these cavities if you use uh, combustible insulation. But on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, you, you have to, to tackle the humidity. So you need some ventilation in these facades. The pictures here is from, uh, from a building uh, where uh, you can see that there is a, the, the black parts are a insulation, a plastic insulation, uh, but in order to prevent the uh, spread, uh, the vertical spread, there's use of uh, a non-combustible uh, fire stopper. Uh, you can see a little bit the details uh, of such an example um, uh, to the right. Uh, what is then, of course, important is that when we put, and you see that on the left, uh, a brick wall in front of that, uh, that this cavity here, which I point now out, is completely tight uh, in case of a fire. But for the humidity, uh, you cannot have that. So you need to allow for <clears throat> a flow of air. And, and that's the, the challenge here, um, so that you, you need to find out uh, how to uh, seal these uh, um, this fire stoppers uh, in one hand in case of a fire, but also still allowing uh, a, a ventilation in it. And, and quite often there are now fire stoppers with intermessing materials uh, to, to tackle that. Uh, another thing which I wanted to, to uh, point out, in fact, in this building is also important that you can have horizontal uh, fire stoppers, which I point out now, but it's also port important and, uh, uh, that you ensure that there is no, uh, that there are, let's say, vertical stoppers. And this is a bit unclear how they would uh, solve that in this building, because you could prevent fire spread from this floor to the next one, but you can have a fire spread uh, in that direction through uh, the staircase. So let's finish up the, uh, the real technical properties. Uh, we now switch over to the social technical system aspect, uh, and that presentation is then uh, given by Brian Meach and, and Mikael uh, Strömgren. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, now we're going to talk, as Patrick said, a little bit about the socio technical system aspects, and in particular about the regulatory assessment model that was developed as part of this effort. And just as a, a reminder, the impetus for some of this work was looking at the tragedy of the Grenfell Tower and how it was just not a failure of the facade system, but of many aspects of the regulatory system. And when you have complex technology that you're working with within a complex building regulatory system, you need to look at the totality of the system in order to understand how all the different bits and pieces need to work together. And so when we're talking about buildings that use uh, complex technology, such as facade systems, that's really a socio-technical system. And to try to explain a bit, there are 
three types of engineering systems, those that can perform their function without either actors or social institutions like regulatory systems uh, across the social structure. And if you think of an airplane, it could be the landing gear or in a building, maybe the facade system. Then you have systems in which actors and some of the sub functions operate, but not everything in total. So you can fly an airplane with people and the airplane, but not a lot of necessarily regulatory oversight in de detail, and that could be a building. But if you have systems that need both the actors, the institutional infrastructure, and the technology, then you're in a socio-technical system. And in the airplane analogy, that would be having the civil aviation system, which provides the overarching control. And for us, it's the building regulatory system, which has all the components to monitor the technology, the actors, and the institutions. And so we think of building regulatory systems as socio-technical systems. And it's a way to look at the interaction of the organizational or institutional aspects along with technology and the various actors and understanding that they're all linked. So you can't just try to solve one part of the problem and hope that you've addressed everything else. In the performance of complex systems, such as buildings with complex technology, such as facade systems, cannot really be fully assessed or regulated unless you look at the complete socio-technical considerations of the building regulatory system. And so work was done previously by myself and others to kind of frame building regulatory systems as socio-technical systems. But when we look to how do you actually assess such systems, you know, we look to research that was done in high risk systems and other disciplines. And we started with work that was done in Sweden, which looked at uh, if you have, you know, shipping industry or something such as chemical process industry, and you have a fast growth of technology, and all of these interactions where maybe the regulation is changing rapidly, the technology is changing rapidly. You find that as you look at connection from government through regulations to the company, to the people, you have a variety of issues in terms of poor communication, uh, specifications may be out in front of the regulations, the technology may be out in advance. And when you're in this period of either rapid technological change or rapid change in the regulatory system, uh, communication is essential and you run the risk if you don't have good structures of seeing failures. And this was put into a, a model to be able to think about, for example, how the control systems through government regulation and how the design processes, for example, of products and the market need to work together and that you have very clear lines of communication and issues that have to be addressed for the system to work well. And if this isn't done, then you can find that there are gaps in communication and competency and oversight and so forth, which could lead to a problematic issue. This concept was advanced further by uh, Nancy Levison at the Massachusetts Indi Institute of Technology in her systems theoretic accident processes and models, where she broke it down into the development of the system and the regulation with that, and then the system operation and how you have a more or less a control center to monitor and oversee that everything works together. And it's this process that we took into the building regulatory system where we see the development of the building regulations, the supporting standards, the competency of the market, the oversight and so forth. Then you have the control side, which is fire safety regulation, safety inspection and so forth. And then you're bringing those together in the operating environment where you have the designer pulling the regulations together and handing them over to the building operator who has to enforce under this other set of requirements. And looking at it in a little bit more detail, 
the system development is looking at how the policy objectives are established, whether you're setting up sound regulation, whether the standards development is tied into the regulation and you have good product certification laboratories and so forth on the development side. And then on the control side, again, you're dealing with the legislation and the regulations about building control and oversight. And here it's a little bit different actors with maybe in our case, the fire service insurers and others. And this all comes together when you get into the actual control system, because here you have the building designers and other actors trying to make sure that the design complies up with the regulations. It's handed over appropriately to the building owner and operator who interacts with the understanding of the safety management processes. And all of these connections and communication have to work really well for the system to work really well. And you can look at the system given this structure by asking a series of exploratory questions around the key areas of those four different components. So you can ask whether the policy objectives and the regulations and the standards and the oversight are really clear, unambiguous. Uh, are there any uh, conflicts from one objective to another. And if you have problems with the policy, you could expect there are problems down the road. On the control side, you're looking at the adequacy of the implementation and enforcement. So here it's the safety regulation enforcement, it's the requirements of the building owner to enforce the system, and how is that really working? And then looking at the control actions specific to the building, are you doing inspection, test, and maintenance? Are you working well in terms of uh, having the occupants of the building well trained? And through all of this, you're looking at the adequacy of the communication paths. Is the information being presented from the regulation down to the design, through to enforcement, onto the building owner for control? And we developed on the order of 80 questions in these different areas and came up with a simple uh, ranking system for looking at the adequacy of these attributes. And we applied these to the regulatory system in England, looking at Grenfell and the regulatory system in Sweden to see if there are issues in Sweden. And again, around buildings and the use of facade systems, which could have similar outcomes to Grenfell. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael to go through, you know, the outcomes from Sweden and, and some of the findings that we had uh, determined. Thanks, Brian. Um, for me, I think it's really exciting to work with uh, a method that's been tried in, in other industries and applied to a complex system like the construction industry. Uh, so what, what do we learn from applying this in practice? Uh, so I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, what we learned when uh, applying uh, uh, the um, socio-technical building regulatory assessment method to the to the Swedish uh, building regulatory uh, system. And uh, the overall results of the assessment uh, shows largely that uh, there are uh, um, inadequacies in the Swedish system um, or all over these um, uh, focal areas that uh, Brian mentioned. Uh, so we're, we're hoovering in for all these areas from policy objectives to uh, adequacy of implementation and enforcement of constraints to the execution of uh, control actions and, uh, and the feedback uh, system. Uh, we're all hoovering about uh, one on this scale from zero to three. Uh, where zero means that uh, that the component refactoring is uh, is missing or insufficient uh, to or, or we have insufficient data to assess uh, whereas uh, one means that it's inadequate two means uh, adequately addressed and uh, three is uh, comprehensively addressed uh, so if we go a bit into the details, well, what does this mean? Um, and I could of course say that uh, well this is a method uh, I think it uh, it also makes sense to use this like an uh, index of numbers that way we can ca compare the results of, of uh, testing this method on, on several different jurisdictions uh, or on different um, um, 
uh, implementations of, of different regulatory systems. So, for example, uh, by doing this on the uh, Swedish regulatory system, it would be interesting to try it on the future uh, Swedish regulatory system, which is currently being revised and, and compare the numbers. Um, so if we go and look a bit deeper into the policy objectives, uh, we can see that uh, some areas are um, a bit um, um, more adequately addressed, such as uh, the, uh, the system, the, the regulations and expression of uh, the requirements for safety in case of fire. Uh, and um, um, we see that there's um, uh, there's also a lack, uh, so especially with, re with regards to uh, uh, licensing and uh, registration of uh, builders and contractors. Um, so in general, we could say that the, the Swedish system has uh, is a quite uh, uh, liberal system with uh, quite few uh, formal uh, requirements and clarity on on what's uh, what's expected on on the. Um, um, from the from the market and uh, and these responsibilities are um, a bit am ambiguous, uh, so we're certainly lacking elements uh, regarding accountability and responsibility, for example. And if we look at implementation and enforcement, uh, we can. I'm not going to do go into all the details. You'll have to read the report for that. Uh, but uh, we see that we have a, a quite strong. Uh, clarity on legal responsibilities for building owners for example um, and some concerning management whereas if we look at um, inspection testing and maintenance there's very few formal requirements and detail requirements um, and uh, we actually see that there's um, um, uh, also fewer few requirements or, or specifications concerning risk management and, and risk assessments. Um, further on implementation and enforcement, uh, we see that there's uh, um, there's uh, few um, measures to ensure that we pass along information to, to, to other stakeholders such as information regarding Design limitations for a uh, for an object or a building. Um, we have um, uh, we share some of the uh, the parts concerning certification of products with with other European countries, of course, and and also England, where we where we also where we also apply this method, um, which is where we see a, a shared concern concerning some areas, uh, whereas we have some yeah, some parts of it is is uh, is more clear um but we also see that the, the building regulatory structure is is quite clear uh, but the connection between uh, the regulations for the existing building versus what is uh, applied when you uh, uh, develop and uh, design the building uh, we see a lacking interrelationships and going into uh, control actions um, we again see uh, a lack regarding um, uh, inspection testing and maintenance of systems uh, ensuring that uh, the that the systems work over time um, and that we have uh, uh, inadequacies regarding uh, risk assessment here as well and ev evacuation in place and so on um, and finally Regarding feedback, uh, this is also an area of concern where we have uh, we have some good examples like uh, standards and certification being timely, the information flow being quite timely and clear. Uh, but in other area, it's it's much less uh, formalized, uh, which uh, means that we have uh, in essence a lack of transparency and uh, trails of information, uh, which uh, of course also makes it harder to perform uh, review and control. Um, all right, so um, this was a, a quick overview. Uh, I'll now get into a quick case comparison. Uh, by uh, earlier this year, um, with the ongoing uh, uh, Grenfell um, inquiry going on uh, there's been some uh, interesting case studies being done and uh, and a good uh, this is i think this is a really good uh, map 
uh, of a case that is similar to ours. And I think it um, uh, strengthens our models because um, another group has actually applied um, the same type of thinking, but to another case. Uh, so this is the, a map showing the, um, the different parties involved in the uh, facade design of the Grenfell Tower. Um, and the inquiry is trying to find out well who and, and this uh, article in from the architect journal from earlier this year is trying to uh, point out who's blaming who who and, and what are their relationships um, so this is really um, showing uh, a similar type of picture that that Brian showed us here earlier uh, where we can see that the um, um, fire engineer seems to have been sort of like um, sidelined in the process at least they that's what they what they say here and uh, what their testimony is uh, and we have a complex uh, relationship between all these actors the design and build contractor the facade contractor uh, and the manufacturers of the various components uh, such as the acm panels and the insulation manufacturers and so on um, and these actors are uh, uh, all um, saying that uh, that other parties in the system was responsible for the for the eventually uh, this eventual risk facade that was implemented in the building uh, which goes to say that this uh, it's it's very important to look at this this uh, um, system and the, and the interrelationships uh, and how do we ensure the for example the flow of information uh, and ensure that we have a, a model where we have the where we create incentives for these parties to work together rather than, uh, uh, than than trying to push along the problem to to someone else which, uh, which which evidently happened here in this case and you also see the line on the top right to the building regulations which shows the other part of, of the figure that uh, that Brian showed um, so going into the the um, a summary of the results um, what we saw was that Sweden and England shared inadequacies regarding roles and responsibilities um, and also understanding of the expected performance. Uh, the, the criteria uh, for safety is not clear enough. Uh, and, um, and that's obviously a, a problem um, when we want societal control of a, of a risk. Uh, we also see that there's um, a lack of competency and um, qualifications structures, such as uh, li licensing certification of uh, practitioners and ensuring that they are competent enough for, for their respective roles. Uh, there's also inadequate control and enforcement. Uh, and in this case, it's driven by uncertainty regarding the responsible entities. Uh, what are their roles and what, what, uh, what should they, what are their responsibilities? There's also insufficient transparency. Um, so we, we don't have a system where we have uh, audit trails or any type of uh, information requirements or very limited, limited such. Uh, which also makes it very hard after an accident occurred, for example. It's hard to find uh, find out who was responsible for what and, and uh, make the, those parties responsible. Uh, and uh, there's also inadequate communication between actors and, uh, and the various um, actor levels. Um, so these shortcomings, they overwhelm the positives for Sweden, uh, where we saw the positives as uh, having um, adequate policy objectives relating to fire, fire performance expectations on the on the bigger level, and there was also a clear regulatory structure, um, and also we see that there's um, uh, an availability of adequate tools of assessment, such as um, uh, fire testing, computer models, and, and so on, and the. What we see as the most important outcomes are that there's a widespread lack of clarity in roles and responsibilities um, and a lack of clear competency and accountability structures. So what are the implications of, uh, of applying the socio-technical system thinking in this context? Uh, we see that buildings are a very complex system and uh, looking at the whole industry um, increases that level of, of complexity. Um, so these complex systems reside within um, uh, socio-technical building regulatory systems uh, and we need to have a, a bigger bigger perspective. So to assess facade performance and uh, possible failure, we need to assess the building regulations, facade technology and supporting infrastructure as a whole. 
So a holistic approach requires a assessment of uh, technical risks, uh, regulatory risks, and, and the needs, as well as the competency and capacity within the industry. Thanks. Um, so back to you, Patrick. The last part of the presentation is uh, about different type of technical fire risk and how we tackle with them. Uh, the picture below uh, is an example uh, from uh, Bowacket where they identify the different uh, possible uh, fire risks or, or fire spread uh, phenomena in, um, in, uh, in a facade system. Um, I not can go here into detail for each of them. Uh, I would like to, to refer to the report, but quickly we can say that uh, when you have a fully developed fire here, you might have a, f uh, a fire spread through the joint system, in number one here. You can have a fire spread through uh, the wall itself, this is number two. And you can have also a fire spread uh, from uh, the flow below into the next floor because of a lack of a good fire resistance of this wall so that the fire will penetrate like that. Or you can even have then a, a fire spread uh, on the surface of the facade. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the risks is, of course, falling apart uh, towards uh, the uh, ground floor level, uh, hindering, of course, uh, a good evacuation, but also hindering uh, the fire rescue services to do their uh, work uh, in case of fire. How do we now determine the fire properties and consider the, these other aspects uh, of, um, um, of facades? Uh, which are complex systems, as I explained uh, earlier. The first way or to, to deal with that, and this is used in many countries, is prescriptive solutions. You define requirements in the regulation and you define uh, corresponding test methods for it. And I just give an example for reaction to fire. You can use a Euro class, BS1, D0, uh, or for fire resistance, you can use a, a rating, for instance, E60. E, uh, so that's a way how, how to deal it uh, and, and then the regulators or, or the building uh, authorities can define uh, the level. But how do we deal that uh, with this, for instance, with these Euro class methods in the construction products uh, regulations? Uh, we all know that CE is, uh, is a mandatory for products uh, and, and materials. Um, but how do we do that with the, with the system? And the example is here, the, uh, so-called uh, rain screen cladding um, shown in the picture uh, where you have the cladding which is a, a product uh, where you have the insulation which is a product or slash material uh, but how do we do that with with a full system so we we have to think about that uh, maybe the rain rain screen cladding has a, a specific uh, uh, classification and the insulation but we need to know how the full system uh, will work in, in case of a fire and that's that is quite important and um, uh, we have a lack of information on that. Challenges of fire tests of course and you see to the right the both the SPI and room corner test is that there are many different tests but there are different fire scenarios and a scenario for a wall lining like a room is maybe not appropriate for a facade. Uh, we have different criteria which we have to look to and we measure different parameters. So there's for the facades where we have uh, maybe almost 10 different large scale tests, there's need for harmonization. And this is very recently done in a pre study by a number of uh, fire testing laboratories uh, and references are also in, in the, um, um, the report um, where a, harmonized test method or is proposed uh, by this group of fire laboratories, uh, which can then be used to assess the, uh, the risk of uh, uh, and the fire properties of a facade uh, system. Another route, be, apart from the prescriptive solution, is uh, to use a performance-based solution. We need the input for that uh, in order to, to check uh, the, uh, the fulfillment of the criteria within the functional uh, design. Not going to go into details about all the aspects of performance-based solutions, um, but uh, a way how it is done is that there have been expert assessments uh, done on these systems based on, on several reports. And I think in this part, the expert assessment, we need really to get more information how they are done and under what conditions and under what criteria. Uh, else it, it can be uh, um, 
a very bad uh, assessment. We can do that also by full-scale tests. Uh, as I explained uh, earlier, that you combine the full-scale test and uh, learn how the criteria can be fulfilled. And then uh, another uh, area is, of course, we can have risk tools like the NFPA effect risk tool. And then finally, we can uh, do modeling. I'm only going to highlight the, the, the tool developed by NFPA. It's called NFPA effect, where you can, by uh, yeah, answering some simple questions uh, about the insulation, the cladding, the possible ignition, and, and so on, uh, get uh, an estimate of the risk uh, through the tool. Uh, and then you can maybe already rule out certain uh, solutions. Another example which we found during the project is, is from the Netherlands uh, by Familo uh, et al. Alternatives of course also doing the functional design with models. But here we again need uh, a lot of input from experts. We need uh, full-scale data with extra measurements maybe. They're not enough from the, the standardized test. Uh, and we need the numerical models and their input and how we validate them and all. And here it's also again important to look to the whole system. The picture to the right is an example where uh, it is um, uh, try to model the, the flame heights within the cavity uh, and all the challenges you have when you do that in, in a CVD program like FDS. And this is just an example with a fully uh, incombustible uh, setup and it gets even more complicated if uh, several of these materials are, are combustible to, to do the flame spread and the flame heights and so on. Uh, there are some more references in the report uh, uh, again uh, about what is done in connection to this uh, report. Conclusions. Um, first of all, it's important to further define a facade system in, in the future so that we get a, a unified uh, definition. Uh, we also have different facade systems which exist and they are not so easy to categorize. Um, also have a lot of difficult technical, uh, different uh, technical properties and their requirements differ depending on the category of a start system. Uh, so we cannot treat it as, as a, a general uh, solution. The facade construction is very complex and they are very complex uh, systems, not only single materials or products. Uh, and if we talk about fire safety evaluation, even the other properties, it's not the fire safety of one single material material who can define whether you can promote the system or forbid uh, the system. It's the overall uh, behavior. Further, building, buildings are very complex systems which reside within complex socio-technical building regulatory systems. And uh, a first order of socio-technical building regulatory system assessment model, the STBRSM, uh, illustrates challenges with current regulatory uh, systems and was performed in this, this project. We have to also always think that there, we have to consider the different risks uh, of, a, of a facade system and uh, we need risk analysis tools. Uh, and they are, we found a number and they are very promising for, for screening um, of, of the uh, overall risk. Important is also to say that uh, before introducing test standards into uh, regulations, regulators should identify which risk they want to reduce and choose the appropriate performance criteria or safety levels. Once they are established a suitable test method or a suitable performance-based solution based on sound fire safety engineering can be chosen. And I push the, 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 the word sound that it has to be uh, well-defined and good uh, high-quality fire safety engineering. And the latter, of course, when a uh, performance-based design allows full innovation. And as such, the holistic approach is therefore necessary for the future uh, to address uh, these many needs. Research questions gap, maybe very quickly. We have talked a lot about the definition and the categorization. Uh, we can do further work on the social technical issues. Uh, and two things which uh, we, we see are interesting is to do a case study of overall properties of facade system by eva evaluating, for instance, 10 to 15 different facades blinded from a scientific point of view. Uh, what are the, the weak points and what are the strong points of these uh, facade systems? We also want to see how expert evaluations uh, assessing uh, the um, uh, facades, uh, especially for fire uh, safety, 
are done from a scientific uh, point uh, of view to learn more about the, the methods uh, used. It would be also interesting to further develop the risk evaluation tools uh, in Sweden or for Sweden uh, and to see how we can see that certain screening methods can be used to uh, evaluate the facades uh, with respect to fire then uh, by intermediate scale test. Uh, within the area of modeling we need a lot more to learn about the input data, what is needed and how they can be evaluated uh, and validated also. Uh, and finally, we need some more robust engineering tools with enough details because, as I said, and I repeat it once more, uh, the facade is a complete system and should be treated in, in a holistic way uh, also uh, by the engineering tools. So that concludes my uh, presentation. I just uh, have this slide, which is dissemination of, of the project. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, list, but uh, it is good for, for reference. Uh, um, if you look to this presentation afterwards. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, of course, Brandforsk, which has been the main sponsor of this work, but I would also like to mention the Swedish energy uh, agencies in the EU, EU GE Grow and the Erasmus Mundus uh, Partners uh, and EBI, which have uh, been linked to this project in one way or another, and it's, it's clear in the report. Also, my, the project partners, LTH Bria, Bria uh, Meacham Associates for their uh, own contributions. I should not forget the project group of the Swedish Building University, uh, which are, is listed here, uh, and the members of uh, the, the reference uh, group of this project. So I would like to thank them all uh, a lot, and I would like uh, to thank you for, for listening, and I'm very happy that uh, I can answer to your questions together with my uh, co-presenters. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Patrick and Michael and Brian. So do you want me to take that first one? Yeah, I can read the question so that everyone can hear. It's, um, it's for Brian, it says here. Uh, how is the situation looking in the US? Are there many facade systems that have been installed with a potential of uh, unacceptable fire spread risk? So thanks for the question. I think uh, as in any of these issues, it's a bit complicated because as you know, Patrick was saying, and we've talked about risk is part of how you look at the system together in the building. So we have some of these materials on high rise buildings because they were allowed, you know, 20 years ago. But also we have sprinkler protection in most of our high rise buildings. And over time we've limited the amount of uh, combustible material in the facade system that would go on high rise buildings starting around 2008. So there is historically some buildings with uh, the materials. However, with our other safety features such as sprinkler systems, two means of escape and others, we tend to think the overall risk level is fairly low. And by using, you know, the NFPA test for facade uh, flame spread, exterior flame spread and other technologies going forward, keeping a reduced amount of that material and having a balanced approach helps us manage the risk. So overall, we're fairly comfortable with the level of risk we currently have. All right, thank you. In, in Sweden, I, I think, um... Uh, it's quite often stated that uh, even if you have your sprinkler inside the building, the, the fire may start on the outside on a balcony or a, let's say a car fire on the, on the street or something like that. Do, do you have the same uh, worries in, in the U.S.? Yeah, so that's always an interesting challenge. You know, what is the source of the fire? And if you have the fire on the facade, what is the potential for a spread mechanism into the building. And, you know, Patrick went through some of the, the failure modes and how that could occur. But part of the system issue is that if you have a sprinkler in the compartment on the inside of the facade system, the fire on the outside may ignite materials in that space, but then the expectation is the sprinkler system will activate in that space to keep the fire from going further within the building. And part of the issue is really 
not so much stopping the fire on the outside, but keeping the fire from spreading on the inside as occurred with Grenfell. And there was actually, you know, an interesting case study, not in the US, but in Australia, the La Crosse building, which was a fire in Melbourne in 2014, which had an exterior facade fire similar to Grenfell moving up the building, but it was a fully sprinklered building. And what happened was that, you know, moving up the balcony system off of the kitchens of each of these uh, floors of the building, the sprinkler system on the inside compartment stopped the spread of fire inside. So in that case, even though the sprinkler system wasn't designed to activate as many heads or to protect against an exterior fire, it did serve the role of minimizing the potential for fire spread in the building, which allowed for everyone to get out safely and for the fire department to extinguish the fire. Okay, thank you. Here's a new question for you. Um... What are the most important issues to solve before we are able to fully model the fire performance of, for example, a ventilated facade partially composed of combustible materials? So what are the most important issues to solve before we can be able to model that? Yeah, I guess that's for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think quite a lot of things, to, to be honest. Uh, um, but uh, I think the, the the major thing is, uh, as I mentioned, is first of all, of course, the uh, a good input data for the different pyrolysis models. I think we're we're good uh, on a good way of it. Uh, and then, of course, it's it's very uh, important since uh, cavities are not so big, is that you you have to to find a, a better balance between the accuracy of of the grid within the cavity and and the interaction of of the flow and the con the, the structure. Um, because you have, and, and you can end up uh, that a lot of the um, the physical phenomena in, in inside the cavities are, are within um, uh, within a, within a boundary layer, and, and I think uh, there's still quite a lot of challenges to to be done. So, uh, um, and to that is of course that you need very accurate uh, small uh, size grids, which at the end of the day they maybe need uh, more computer power and so on. So. I think that's that's very uh, important, uh, and then we we have of course the issue um, which um, uh, up to now of, of course we, we within the the fire tools project which we had with DBI we try to to look into that but uh, some of these materials will not stay in place uh, they will melt they will drop down they will fall down and so on and that influences a lot the behavior and uh, I think that part is is. Um, more maybe on a macro scale, uh, scale. The first thing was maybe a, more on a micro scale uh, to, to be solved uh, in the boundary, but this is more on a macro scale to try to see when is a panel, for instance, falling down, when is it melting. Uh, um, so, and I think there are good attempts done, and there were some examples in, in Interflam from the Ganfell fire, but, but I think we, we still need, need a lot of uh, further um, uh, knowledge and, and development. So, uh, it's always very easy, as we, we all know to uh, to model the, the fire after it happens, but it's much more difficult to predict it uh, in, in advance. Um, I hope that's somehow a summary of all the things, the least uh, to be done. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, I have one for you. Um, when looking at the... Um, you talked about that, Michael, the regulatory framework, and, and you've been studying that. And um, different countries are, are actually moving in different directions right now. What are the pros and cons in different ways to attack this, do you think? Well, I think it's, um, it's a challenge to uh, develop a building regulatory system that is... Um, uh, optimal for the for the given problem. It's uh, you have to give and take. Uh, you want a cost efficient system, but uh, that also leads to safe buildings in the end. Um, and we see, I can say that, um, uh, like the ongoing Swedish revision, we want uh, cost efficient housing, but we still and we still want the uh, uh, flexibility and uh, and we want uh, the innovation track. We want the industry to be 
empowered to be able to innovate and, and create the solutions that may be addressing uh, new societal needs over time. Uh, for example, new materials, uh, introducing new technologies, solar panels and or green buildings or whatever, which which eventually leads to new new challenges for the buildings as well in terms of uh, risk. Um, but it, it's a really hard uh, challenge. And, um, and as Brian outlined, all these components matter. Uh, the competence of the practitioners, uh, the authorities, um, how we ensure that uh, we have uh, proper uh, feedback mechanisms and among all these stakeholders who, who are part of the system. Um, how we express uh, clarity regarding the uh, performance of the buildings, uh, what what level is uh, safe enough, and so on. Um, and to me, I think the one of the most important things are creating a a system where we where we give the incentives to the different stakeholders to do the the best things from their own horizons, um, and and still giving them the in the incentives to to push it in the direction that is uh, beneficial from a societal standpoint. And uh, I fear that we, the current discussion in Sweden is quite focused on uh, the building regulations, uh, Beber, uh, Boerwerkers building regulations, uh, and only parts of the review and control system. We are we're sort of missing the, the really big picture here. Where, where all these other matters, um, uh, things matter as well in the, in the system. And I think uh, my, my impression is that, that after Grenfell Tower, um, they have um, done a more comprehensive review of the, of the UK system. Um, however, they are walking in a different direction there as well with uh, some prescriptive measures that may actually uh, be um, causing it might be causing problems for other goals such as sustainability and so on since they introduce matters or um, basically uh, material bans for example banning certain banning combustible materials for example may lead to problems in in other areas uh, but um, looking at a really big picture and maybe using the uh, the SDS framework as a guide uh, when looking at all, all these essential components would, would be, be my my tip to to um, to develop a better system. Okay, thank you. And now we have time for more questions, so please uh, write your questions in the Q and A. Um, and just a, just a follow up on that, Michael or or, or Brian or Patrick. Uh, you you said I think all of you said that facades is a very very complex system and and. Uh, is it possible to have so complex systems uh, and actually get it all right in the end? Well, I guess I'll take a, a stab at that. I mean, I, I think part of this overall discussion really to me is what there's, there's different factors, but one is what is a tolerable risk? You know, we're never going to be able to design a perfect system, <clears throat> excuse me, that has all the attributes for <clears throat> moisture protection, thermal insulation, sustainability, fire resiliency, mechanical performance. I mean, there and still have innovation in the market. And so, what we can do is understand what the range of, you know, uncertainty is around the different components but then look at how the regulation holistically deals with, you know, the objectives of, if you're looking at moisture protection, thermal energy and fire, you know, is there a weighting between those functions? Do you want them to equally perform the same? And what are the risks if you fail within one or more of those areas? And so the whole idea of setting up test standards or modeling or, other assessment tools has to be to whatever that level of performance is. And uh, a little bit, I'm a risk person, there's always a probability of failure. And I think part of the issue is what types of failure are acceptable at what levels? And if it's an occasional major failure, what are we trying to avoid from kind of the catastrophic 
perspective and just build, you know, holistically that approach of, of risk management and, and probability into the system. Okay, thank you. Now we have a new question for you. Um, critical to this subject, uh, uh, subject area and all aspects of fire safety engineering uh, is the design fire. What are the thoughts on this? Um, for example, in a sprinkler building, the sprinklers may fail. Should we assume it never will or move forward uh, with probabilistic design only? The alternative is to carry on using deterministic design, which seems wrong. Sorry, this question may have been answered prior. My internet keeps dropping. <laughs> well, don't worry about it. Um, I think it's a very good question. What is um, uh, what's good enough here? Well, maybe I'll continue and then the others can jump in. Just following on my you know, previous comment in response to your question is that, you know, fire is stochastic. And I think we should be doing, you know, risk-based design, which is nominally probabilistic. And if you look at how, you know, the new ISO standard for fire safety engineering has been modified, we made a change to call all fire safety engineering risk-based design. Because even if you're doing it kind of deterministically, somebody is inherently determining the level of risk that's acceptable in the regulation and in the test standard and so forth. So it's really an issue of how far do you go with uh, defining these different areas and, and, you know, moving forward with actual probabilistic design. But I think on the issue of whether it's a design fire or whether it's the fire resistance rating of a, a particular compartment, whether it's the expected performance of fire stop material, each component has a failure potential. So you're really only going to get a picture of how the building is likely to perform if you take all of those uh, reliability factors into play. And I think with deterministic design, you run two major risks. One that you uh, very much over design because you're looking at a design fire that is so big the protection is way over designed or it's too small and you don't put any kind of redundancy into your system. And so if you have a reasonably expected fire, you won't expect the building to perform. So if you keep to deterministic, you really have to look at the endpoints and, and make decisions thinking about it from a robustness perspective. And I think that's where a lot of deterministic design falls down. Right, do you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, I think I can. Yeah, I uh, almost agree completely with Brian. Maybe I just wanted to add is that in, in such a system where you, you maybe uh, use a combination of a probabilistic uh, risk tool together with, with uh, parts where you do the deterministic uh, evaluation with certain design for fires to know the outcome and the consequence. Uh, I think in the whole process, it's important to know the uncertainties in, in the hell systems. Uh, and I, I think we we sometimes skip that uh, a bit too too quickly uh, so that even in our very first risk assessment we need to know what what is our uncertainty of um, forgetting something and so on and and i think that's that's important but i, but I agree with uh, with greg in, in his question that uh, um, we maybe sometimes go a little bit too much to the the, the single or two or three type of design fires and, and are happy with that i think we we should do an overall uh, assessment, but um, um, and and especially important for the regulators to know that. Um. Yes, yes, and you said that in the presentation as well that the regulators re really need to state what risk to handle before you invent another testing method. Um. Yeah, and no, maybe also know what if if the the certain route to chosen of or if the design fires are chosen and so on and. If if you um, have a, a technical system which uh, uh, which prevents maybe the the growth of the fire, you have to know what the consequences are if it did, it doesn't work. Um, that's something what Brian said also, I think, which is yeah. also important. That is the co consequence an, a real disaster or is it uh, a, li a bit more damage or a lot more damage? So I think you have to know that, otherwise you step into the unknown. 
Yes. I could also chime in here. Um, <laughs> so one one thing that I find interesting in this case is also how it will well it connects to the um, um, to the part of the STS system. Um, so if we if we look at the at the facade system as a as a complex technical problem, um, it's not only about the initial uh, risk assessment and the and the design. We also look need to look at the at how well we uh, make sure that we uh, assure compliance all the way to the finished building. Uh, so we know that certain uh, facade systems may be even more complex or uh, more fail prone. Uh, they may be really sensitive to what's being done on the construction site. Um, and uh, what's interesting here is that we have very few formal requirements in Sweden for uh, uh, for the installers of such systems uh, and, and for the uh, quality control system of the organizations involved in this process, taking it from design into the um, uh, construction of the building and then into the facility management phase. Um, so that, that's a really uh, failure prone area where I think uh, we need to look a bit more on, on, on how, we, how we could, how could we improve this system uh, so for example when we have uh, the, the potential of uh, bigger consequences or when we have uh, maybe more um, failure prone systems why don't we have a stricter review and control system with uh, with more uh, checkpoints for example um, i think that that's something that would be worth mentioning to make sure that that this uh, this uh, uh, chain of um, uh, or this process leading to a fire safe building so that it's it's connected and not uh, and not having these uh, weak links because if we have we we only need one weak link somewhere in this chain of events to to have a building that may be unsafe in the end okay so not a one size fits all uh, control system for everything in the building but to maybe improve some of them right Okay, um, so out in the audience right now, we have uh, many different kind of, of uh, people with different professions, uh, fire services, for example, fire safety consultants and, and so forth. Um, what's your advice to them? You know, they are out there in the reality right now. Uh, do you have any, any advice for the fire service, for example, according to what you know about the facade systems and or maybe the fire safety consultants. Yeah, maybe I, I can start with the fire rescue services and maybe the others can jump in also in the other aspects. But I, I think it's uh, also important for them to know what type of system is behind the, uh, the very first facade, <laughs> um, behind it and what's, what's happening there and what could um, be the consequences if it uh, can fall down. I think that's very important. Um, I gave also the example if, if it's very innovative systems uh, there may be other risks for them also and there's been a lot of discussions on, on solar panels and on facades and yeah so uh, I think that it is for them very important to know that the documentation is well before they especially if the, the building is a bit higher. We don't have too many high-rise buildings in Sweden but, but I think it's anyhow important to, to, to know that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think for the fire consultancy, I would say that, that um, um, yeah, both Brian and Michael are, are in that area. I've met uh, from my point of view, I think it's important also for them to, to assure that uh, the system is exactly as what has been approved uh, and that you're very clear in describing it uh, so that it's not un unclear what type of materials maybe should be used and so on and assessing it also, I think. Uh, at the design level is very important. Uh, we mentioned that in, in the presentation, also the expert uh, assessment of, of a system which maybe not has been fully tested, but some small changes have been done. There we have to know uh, and maybe have to have more guidance what can be uh, acceptable, what is um, dangerous. Yeah, and maybe following up a little bit, you know, for me, I think in in most countries, but in particular, my understanding of Sweden, where the you know the building owner 
has the responsibility and you're engaging you know the fire safety engineer through contract and you're you're engaging with a, a wide range of actors to bring together this ultimate system that you call a building and you're relying significantly on all of these people to you know provide as patrick says the right materials the right design having it constructed in the right manner making sure that when it's installed it's operating correctly and that you have as michael talked about the information chain that goes through that so you can hand it over to your insurer to your to the local fire service and everybody knows what was designed what was actually constructed what the issues might be and therefore what the responses might be going forward and i think when you do not have that you know connectivity of information in the system either as a function of the regulatory system or the way the market works or both then none of the players in the system have the level of information they need and that's when you get to the, the really high risk situations so if i if i continue um i i'd uh, give two advice to to both the designers and the and the fire brigades um, I'd say that for facades, there's the, the devils in the details, um, and I think uh, fire engineers in Sweden, in general, uh, are um, maybe not getting into the technical aspects as much as we should do. Uh, we should uh, be more aware of all the technical details and uh, try to understand it better, and also improve our competence in that area. Um, and uh, I've seen uh, fire tests where. Um, um, in full scale where um, only a small deviation like adding a, an air gap in the facade or uh, switching a material um, which which led to worse fire performance even though it, the initial assessment was well this this should be a become a better uh, facade with a better fire performance um, so um, it's it's hard or, or a complex area to to assess uh, and the other thing is that we one one thing we did when we when we looked into the facade situation in Sweden uh, after Grenfell, we realized that in uh, in most of our own products and in, in others' uh, products, uh, for most buildings we we don't have a proper as built record after the building has been uh, erected. So uh, it's really hard to uh, uh, track back and find uh, the actual. Uh, as built documentation uh, detailing the materials in the in the buildings and so on so i would be aware of that as a designer and maybe try to get a bit more into the details in those products too and, and make sure that those details are captured and not just the the, the should specifications for the for the building uh, we also know want to know what it uh, what we, it eventually became and uh, how how they how all the uh, the detailed design was carried out and how you solved all the all the problems in, in practice um, and if we compare that with uh, with the situation in uk they um, they actually had to uh, go into and look into uh, thousands of buildings in the uk to identify similar facade types as the Grenfell tower building um, and they had to take uh, material probes from those buildings by drilling holes in the in the facades uh, and send that to test labs to 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 um, assess the fire performance. Um, so by comparison to the like the automotive industry, where you would uh, immediately have recalled uh, the thousands of cars that had uh, faulty components, uh, the construction industry is really lagging behind. So having more proper information infrastructure would really be helpful to to improve the construction sector and make sure that we have proper feedback mechanisms. All right, thank you. It's very good. Uh, interesting answers. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if there's anyone in the audience, or uh, otherwise I would like to um, to ask you, um, what do you think, um, I mean, you stated a lot of things in, in your report, uh, what's needed to do, but I think in the short term, what's, what's the next step, you think? Uh, if, you, if you were able to start something tomorrow, what would you do? 
Okay. I guess you expect uh, some kind of prioritization of the list at, at the end of the presentation. And uh, I personally would think it would be very interesting to look to, to some real practical systems which are uh, built and to, to do an assessment, not only on the fire part, but on all the technical aspects. That, that would be interesting. And to look to the process, uh, which also Brian and Michael have uh, described, how it has been there at the end of the day. Uh, I think that would be a very interesting thing. It's not easy because it's very sensitive, um, because you're going to use it from existing buildings and, and look to them uh, and maybe don't want the answers you get. Uh, but I think that that would certainly be uh, be an interesting uh, aspect, uh, which combines all the aspects in in this project uh, uh, as a start of a case study. Um, I think that all the other things are also very interesting, as as you can imagine. I I feel so. All right, thank you, Brian. Yeah, and and maybe in my response, I'll I'll add a little bit from the question that uh, was asked as well. For me, you know, the general problem with any regulatory system and compliance is that we don't know what performance we're aiming for. And, you know, it's hard to develop tools, test methods, and, and all the rest if you don't know what you're aiming for. And so as, as a, the comment was made, that pushes people back to prescriptive. But some countries are moving to trying to develop uh, risk-based criteria, for example, individual risk to life value for the building of any contribution from a building-related failure. So it could be structural failure, fire safety failure, uh, failure of the HVAC system that could lead to indoor quality problems or, or weather uh, issues, moisture penetration. So my fundamental thought is that if we really want to get beyond this prescriptive system with very kind of pass-fail test systems and which don't deliver data for the models, we have to get to a level that says, you know, here is the quantitative performance expectation in risk or other measurable way. Here are the data that we need to be able to assess that performance. And here's the form of the tool, whether it's computational or, or physical test method to achieve it. And that I think re takes a, a real change in mindset to move in that direction. So it's maybe a bigger issue for me than just the focus of facade, but I don't think you can solve completely the facade problem without tackling the bigger problem. Right, thank you. Michael. Yeah, so one thing that, that I would think would be interesting is that, uh, well, we talked about facades being a complex area and it's involving a lot of different stakeholders and we have a lot of different objectives that we need to meet from the facade. So I would imagine that uh, doing a case study looking at um, a complex facade system and looking at the at the process of getting to our our to, to meeting those objectives would be really interesting and fleshing out how how what's the usual uh, process here of getting there to this and I think that a lot of the problems we see there are related to communication that we we um, uh, often fail to communicate the fire safety aspects and maybe and also maybe understanding the other aspects that needs to be fulfilled so looking at that and fleshing out uh, what's um, um, what's the current process and what would be a new proposed process how can we improve this communication and, and make sure that fire safety is um, adhered to all the way uh, to, to the to the finished building um, how can we do it more more efficiently? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just wrap things up here now. Thank you for, for all the good questions and thank you for all the good answers. And um, I would also like to, to inform you that if you uh, want to attend more Brown Forest webinars, you can find them at our website or by following us on LinkedIn and you can also register to our newsletter can find that in the bottom of our web page. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel uh, where you can find earlier webinars and recorded webinars. And this uh, webinar you can find there probably tomorrow, I think. And um, 
right now we have our web page in Swedish. We are working on an English uh, version as well. I also would like to thank my colleagues and um, uh, Francis Irinus and Matthias Samarin has been producing this and just make, making everything work so smoothly. Um, and thank you again uh, to the speakers and to the audience. And we will send you a questionnaire tomorrow and please answer that. That's very valuable for us. And I hope to see you again soon on our webinars. We have two coming up in June. Uh, so please uh, tune, in, tune in on them. Thank you. Bye-bye.